So some may ask, why did I join this session? Right, that's a great question as we kind of jump into today's content. You may be looking to explore nested based manufacturing. You may have potential questions related to nesting and or its levels of automation that are available to the manufacturing strategy. You may be wondering, is there a nesting solution that's suited for my specific production? Or maybe better yet, you have a nesting solution now and you're looking to understand if there is a potential solution that's better suited for your particular application. You may be looking to identify general outputs of today's nesting solutions. Possibly collecting information for consideration of a future investment. Maybe looking for assistance in calculating an ROI. Or, and I think this is an important thing to discuss today, right? Everything that we do in these events isn't necessarily based around you having to buy a new machine. So we will spend some time today with tips and tricks that may help you take a machine that you already have and make it just a bit more efficient and effective for your shop. At the conclusion of the two sessions related to this, to this webinar, you will be able to compare various levels of nesting automation, make a, a, a useful identification of which levels of the solution may apply to your application or your shop. Des describe strengths and weaknesses of each of the solutions. This is something that we'll also spend some time with today. I personally believe as a manufacturer and a sales and service entity for manufacturing solutions, we have to be open and capable of speaking to you about the strengths of the solutions, but also open upfront and honest about the potential weaknesses of the solutions also. And we'll work on that today. And we will want you to be able to relate output expectations of the machines with the specific labor requirement of each machine. And with those objectives clearly stated, let's jump into the content of the presentation. So looking at our attendee list for today's event, we have a wide range of participants, some without nesting or without much automation in the shop at all, and others that are on the high end or the, the, the right spectrum, the high end of automation in their shops. In either case, um, we're gonna start by giving ourselves a benchmark of what nesting is, right? So for us to have a, a good event today, this is the benchmark that we're working from, right? Nesting is the process of efficiently manufacturing parts from flat raw material, in most of our cases, right, melamine panels, into a pattern that will minimize material waste and increase material yield. So as we kind of jump in, uh, this slide is, is, is nice, it's busy, it's also a little bit scary, right? Um, we're gonna use it as a baseline and work our way up through levels of automation until you get to what you see on your screen there. Clearly automation is possible, right? And I think a statement that might be more important in this, in this context is that nesting can and does drive production in a lot of shops in North America today. So as we work our way through today's presentation, we're basically showing you the building blocks of how to integrate linear flow, linear production into your shop by way of what we call through feed nesting, right? Automatically through feeding parts through the machine. We basically do that with five components that we have the ability to kind of build and add on to machines and grow with you as your businesses grow, right? So if we start with position A there, basic CNC nesting machine, 
adding some sort of outfeed or discharge table to the scenario. Possibly automating the infeed of the nested machine. Considering an integrated automated labeling system. And then ending with a larger scale material storage and retrieval system. So within this week's presentations today, uh, we, will, we will kind of segregate these things as, as basic concepts that are easy for us to understand and easy for us to discuss with our sales partners as you look to consider these type of things or even better understand them in the future. Today, we will talk about a basic machine as well as what we'll call handling concept number one. And then within Friday's uh, presentation, we will pick up the last three components of potential nesting automation. So let's start with the basic solution, right? What does that look like? That looks like the router on your screen there. So in general terms, you manually load the raw material to the, to the work table, the machine cuts the parts and drills the parts, and then the operator manually unloads and cleans the machine in preparation for the next nest. In general terms, uh, that's basic nesting, right? So we do have a series of strengths and nesting, and, and it's clear to understand nesting is not new, right? Nesting has been growing in the United States for many, many years, 20, 25 years. Um, it's initial strengths that, that had people interested in making investments in the technology don't really change, right? It's, a, it's largely a zero setup technology meaning the program is created in the office, the optimization or the nest is, is generated in the office. As long as the machine has the proper diameter drill bits and the proper tools in its tool changer or in its main spindle, the operator largely loads the raw panel to the machine and that's the majority of the setup. Some of its other strengths it has the ability to not only process square parts, but also shapes. If we have curved closet components, circles, squares, triangles, right? Uh, wire chases, pockets within the, within the program, the machine has, has no issue dealing with that. The other value of nesting is that it also is, handles vertically drilling or vertical drilling quite efficiently. So I, we see in parentheses there two for one in other uh, markets around the world, that's kind of how the sales teams work to sell nesting. It's the customers refer to them as two for one machines, right? Formatting and sizing parts as well as vertical drilling. Uh, the general technology is very accurate and also fairly quick. So if you are, let's say you're a, a smaller shop, you run uh, an Altendorf sliding table saw, you have a dado saw set up and a manual line boring machine for your vertically drilling. A nesting machine, even in, in its basic format, will come in and typically replace those three machines and those two or three people with one machine and one operator and often do it in half to a third of the time of the manual setup. Nesting provides for construction method flexibility, meaning the router doesn't care how you assemble the parts. You can do dado, you can do dowel, you can do conformat, you can do staple and screw. As long as you're, you know, you're able to program that in the office, the machine will, 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 will take care of that work with, without caring, right? It doesn't necessarily matter. So we see customers often grow with CNC machines. They'll start with Dado. Uh, that's kind of where the software, third-party software vendors kind of lead you. And as, you know, production volumes grow and the capacity of the machine becomes, you know, utilized at almost 100%, Sometimes customers will say, hey, I want to, I need to buy another machine or I'm gonna run a swing shift. Others will say, hey, what if I switched from dowel construction, which takes more time on the machine to dado, which takes less time on the machine. Do I, are we gonna have any issues with that? And no, the machine does not. And lastly, this is probably the biggest change that I've seen in the market um, in my career here at Styles, uh, almost 15 years since I've decided a career in woodworking was for me. Uh, today's nesting machines, based upon their cost, their quality, and their speed, are often justifiable um, for shops that run them hours per week and not days. Um, 15 years ago, if, 
if a, if the machine wasn't going to run 40 hours per week in a shop, it was a hard sell, right? Today, um, if we're doing, you know, what two or three people are doing manually in five days of, of panel processing work, if the router is able to do that in one day, right, we are seeing people make that investment, make, they have the confidence in that. And what you see with, uh, with that displaced labor is that we reallocate it elsewhere in the shop, right? Maybe the guy that was running the slide and table saw five days a week, runs the router for a day or a day and a half, and then splits time on an edge bander, on an assembly bench, possibly putting hardware in doors and drawers. Um, we're seeing those type of justifications now become very prevalent in our small to mid-sized shops. Uh, weaknesses, there are some, of course. Um, within nesting, if you have had a nesting machine or you have an older one now, you understand it has a limited velocity, meaning there's only so many sheets a day you can put through an, a traditional nested machine. The process is fairly dirty, um, meaning as you're creating these parts, you got vacuum that's holding the parts to the table. You got dust collection that's trying to pull dust out of the cut. And in all reality, the dust likely stays on the table, right? After you're done running the program, the operator has to clean it, largely blow it off the table and into the air and behind the machine in the shop. A traditional or a basic solution nesting machine is largely operator dependent, meaning, right, if it takes a few minutes for the machine to cut apart, but 20 minutes for the operator to unload it and load the next part, right, the machine is not going to be as productive as an operator who's really in tune and pushing the machine. And lastly, if you, if your shop does run uh, on barcode labels and you're running a basic nesting machine, typically you're cutting the parts, then labeling them while the parts are on the machine table. And that consumes minutes per cycle where the machine is not cutting parts, but potentially could be. Some tips. So let's say you have a, a basic nesting machine or you're looking to invest in one. What are some very ineffective tools, tips, or technologies that you can uh, call into action and make your machine, you know, five, six, 10% more productive. In terms of dust collection, all of the major tool manufacturers man or offer something called, it's like a tornado type tool. Uh, it either attaches to or it's built into the tool holder and it creates a, a vacuum or a vortex, which in effect almost pulls the dust and chips out of the cut and throws them up into the chute of the router where your dust collection volume, your air volume has the ability to then move it into the dust collector. Um, they're really, I don't think there is a preference, right? If you have a, a relationship with the tooling manufacturer, they would be able to tell you what they have. There's a specific type that I like. Uh, they're not built into the tools, a couple hundred bucks, and they actually replace the, the collet nut on your HSK tool holder and it screws on it clamps your, your spring collet and also serves as that kind of that tornado type tool. And uh, they do a nice job. Um, other things that we'll see that will limit the velocity of a traditional nested machine is running raw material sizes that are smaller than the table size on the machine. So let's say you are a cabinet shop who runs largely four by eight material but you also do some solid surface countertop work. So you previously invested in a five by 12 machine, right? When you're running four by eight sheets on that older five by 12 machine, you're likely covering up the open areas of your spoil board to prevent vacuum from escaping and in effect concentrate it to the area of the four by eight sheet that, that you're running at that moment. In today's market, uh, the machines carry, or most of them carry, an automated vacuum or an automated matrix table system where the machine will read the incoming program size for the raw board and with a series of valves built into the under underside of the machine it will automatically set itself up for that four by eight sheet so what that means is we don't have to you know cover up the table with scrap pieces of of melamine we don't have to cover it up with scrap pieces of of um, different type of materials and you also eliminate the need to physically lift up your spoil board and possibly move gasket lines around to, to gasket materials. So earlier I said they're largely zero setup in that 
you know, if you're running smaller raw boards than the size of the machine, you could potentially have some setup. If you choose a machine with an automatic zoning system, you can become largely zero setup. Uh, some small things that we see, manual sweeps. And what I mean by that is I've seen some customers do some pretty innovative things. They'll build little carts uh, that they'll push up to the machine after the nest is finished. They'll almost rake all of the finished parts off the machine, plus the debris, plus the sawdust onto this table. That leaves just a little bit of dust on the table to blow off. And then within that cart, they'll slide the next sheet on. It's a pretty, pretty slick little system to help uh, increase the throughput of a machine. We see customers do vacuum drops, right? If you don't wanna blow the dust all over your shop, drop a four inch line from your dust collector. You can use it as a, a little vacuum to clean off your spoil board after program is finished. Or some customers will um, drop them down to the floor and put like almost a little dust collector fitting on it. And they'll sweep the dust that's on the floor into this little fitting throughout the day so that there's not a, you know, a snow drift of, of, of sawdust around the machine at the end of the day. And lastly is a little bit of a software tip. Um, there is a software strategy. It's been around for a while, but it's becoming super popular now called stay down nesting. What that does in effect is it creates an algorithm or a, or a machining pattern where the tool basically enters the nest one time and cuts all of your parts out with not, without coming out of the cut until it's done. So two things happen there. One, it's a little bit more efficient, usually about 5% faster cycle time. Two, within that stay down nesting routine, the tool will often travel through a path that's been cut twice and it will get some of that extra dust that was left in the cut. So you're cleaner and faster. And this is a, 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 a manufacturing strategy or software strategy. You just have to kind of ask your, your software provider do they offer it? It's common in cabinet vision, it's common in cut right, uh, it's common in alpha cam, those type of things. So just kind of think about that a little bit as you look to potentially become more efficient with the machine that you've already paid for. So when I say nesting is dirty, what you see on your screen is what I'm referring to. That's a, I think a four by eight nest of upholstered furniture parts. Uh, the good parts have been removed and carted away. And this is what we say when the operator has to take care of dust and debris and waste in preparation for the next nest to be brought to the machine. I would also like us to be able to, at the conclusion of this presentation, designate between process time and cycle time. I think this is important. As we as manufacturers and sales folks talk to you about machines, we often want to talk to you about process time, right? Meaning how fast can the machine cut the parts? It, it's important, but if you're looking to build an ROI or understand the true throughput of a machine, cycle time is what you need to be basing those data and those decisions on. The graphic here uh, shows both a process time here, and this is just a general uh, processing time for a four by eight sheet of cabinet parts. Um, and I think this is based on data construction. You're typically gonna run around six minutes to six minutes and 30 seconds of processing time on the machine with traditional tools and traditional processing speeds, right? That's typically where we as sales folks stop with you what we need to also be directing you to is what else within the process of operating that machine adds to its cycle time, right? We have to load raw material to the machine. We have to unload and sort and potentially label parts that are coming off the machine. We put them on carts, we sort them, and then we have to clean the matrix table or the spoil board of the machine in preparation for the next program. So what we're seeing here is a processing time of six minutes, 30 seconds, and just give assigning some time to these items, a cycle time of 12 minutes and 30 seconds. And what that means for you in eight hours of manufacturing, about 38 four by eight sheets of production. In general terms for me, uh, one four by eight sheet is one cabinet. So, I mean, this is nothing to shake a stick at. It's right, 38 cabinets a day. 
But what's important to understand here is within these red items, these are items where the machine is not operating. It's not cutting, but it's not broken, right? It's simply waiting on an operator to do the, the components of the cycle that he's responsible for doing. So what we're gonna do here now is we're gonna jump into um, a demonstration. We're gonna beam this presentation down to our showroom in High Point, North Carolina. And we are going to run the machine through a basic four by eight nested cycle of a cabinet. So that's Mr. Greg Hodges, one of our application engineers down in High Point, North Carolina. You can see he has chosen the ugliest yellow canary melanin board ever produced. What you saw there is he just loaded it to the machine, referenced it to a section of reference pins, hit a foot pedal on the floor to actuate vacuum, and started the machining cycle. Within a nested based program, the machine is, the machines are almost always programmed to do that what we call the machining functions first. They're going to do their vertical drilling. They're going to do your five millimeter system holes. It's going to do your eight millimeter construction holes if you're doweling. It's going to do dados and rabbits and grooves and pockets and wire chases, all while the panel is still whole. And the last step is to come back through and actually break apart the physical parts. Sometimes we're calling it profiling, sometimes sizing, some manufacturers call it formatting. Um, but nonetheless, do your intricate work on the large part so that we are as accurate as possible. Then come back through and create your individual pieces. So as the machine finishes up a drilling routine, now what you're going to see here is a rather simplified nest, right? I'm not trying to make you stand here for 12 minutes watching videos. Um, I think there's six part nests, some drilling, system holes, some drilling of construction holes, and then we went out and bought some pretty nice tooling, and we're going to run the actual profiling of the parts or the sizing parts at about 50 meters per minute, which is around 2,000 inches per minute, if you're more comfortable speaking in those terms. It's a little bit fast, right? I would say a typical shop running a machine like this will run anywhere from 20 to 30 meters per minute. Um, but nonetheless, it is nice to know that the machines can be pushed to that level of throughput or processing speed if and when you do need it. So you can see here now the machine is in what we call the stay down portion of the nest. That router, that router bit is in the cut and will not come out until the last part is processed. machine finishes up, goes to a parking position so Greg has full access to unload the finished parts from the nest. And now he'll go through and basically unload sort and prepare the table for the next sheet of raw material. like one last quick hit with the vacuum and that machine would be prepared for the next program. So a question we often get in these situations is how did you hold the yellow board to the machine, right? So that's done with vacuum. Machines typically have one, two, or three vacuum pumps depending on what your application and altitude is. And a spoil board is, is affixed to the machine between the machine table 
and the raw part being processed, right? So it's a disposable work surface, which acts as a buffer between the nested machine and the raw part. Some general questions that we're, we get, and we're gonna kind of answer them before they pop up, right? What's the typical thickness of a swirl board? Uh, generally three quarter inches or 19 millimeters. Um, with most of the common vacuum systems available today, we're typically looking for a 45 pound density spoil board. Um, if you question that or you're not sure what to get, talk to your machine manufacturer, talk to your vacuum pump supplier, and they'll be able to steer you in the right direction as to what type of density uh, spoil board performs best with their, their vacuum system. Um, do we affix it to the machine, right? And if we do, how do we affix it to the machine? So the first part of that question is, do we have to affix it to the machine? Uh, the answer is yes and no. It's a little bit application dependent. Um, how small are the parts? How often do you, to, do, you, do you surface your spoil board? And are we utilizing any source of system to push the parts off the machine? Um, what's important there is if you don't have to affix the spoil board to the machine, uh, don't, right? Because what that does is it eliminates the need for you to machine it, drill it, and countersink holes before you install it to your machine. So your ability to change a spoil board can be 10 or 15 minutes instead of 20 or 30 or 40. And if you do have to affix it to the spoil board, most machine ma manufacturers today provide a, you know, threaded matrix table so you can, you can do that. You typically do it with a nylon uh, screw or a brass screw so that if you do accidentally, you know, drill or machine into that screw, that it's soft and doesn't, doesn't kill the tool. Cutting depth, um, how deep through the good parts should you cut through into the spoil board to ensure you have uh, acceptable finish quality on the top of the panel and the bottom of the panel. Typically with the machine that's operating with intolerance, you should only be cutting uh, between one and 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 millimeters into your spoil board. And that's, I would say, common across most manufacturers today. And this is a big one. I say tool length compensation. So what happens with spoil boards as you cut into them, you know, a tenth or two tenths of a millimeter over the course of a, of a day, you have to flatten that spoil board out at some point, and that's called fly cutting it. We'll talk about that in the next, the next slide. But what happens is when you fly cut a spoil board, you actually change its thickness, meaning you, its elevation decreases. And in older machines, after you fly cut your spoil board, you have to go back into your tool database and change the offsets of your tools to match the new thickness of the spoil board. This is a good question to ask as you consider new investments as some or many now offer an automatic tool length compensation, meaning they track the thickness of the spoil board and as you fly cut it and make that thickness smaller, it automatically updates the tools accordingly without the operator having to do anything. A little bit more information on fly cutting, right? So as you cut channels or scars, as some people refer to in your spoil board throughout the course of a day, um, you basically flatten it or fly cut it as needed. Um, how often should you do this? I say, you know, in a 15 to a 25 sheet a day operation, I say daily. In most cases, I say hit it in the morning, right? That gives you the opportunity to ensure that your spoil board is flat. They are porous, right? Meaning that's how vacuum is sucked through them. Porous materials are also suspect to soaking up moisture from the air and they will do that at the ends of the spoil board. So if you fly cut it in the morning, you will ensure that the ed edges of your spoil board are the same thickness as the middle. Uh, typically in today's market, we're using a four inch fly cutter. Uh, it allows you to move pretty quickly. Um, as the expected processing time of a, let's use a five by 10 spoil board, you should be in the three to three and a half minute range. Um, if you are, operating a machine from a few years ago and the initial tool that you were supplied with the machine was a two inch fly cutter. Um, you could be in the six to eight to 10 minute cycle time depending on the size of your of your raw raw spoil board. Um, four inch fly cutter, a few hundred dollars, that might be something as a tip and a trick where you can become more efficient with the machine you already own. Um, 
I say in today's market, if you're buying a new machine, I think most manufacturers will supply you with the spoil board cutting program delivered with the machine. You don't have to create it yourself. Those are good questions to ask your sales engineers or your sales partners as you're considering your investments. When you put or bring a new spoil board to the machine, you should fly cut both the top and the bottom side of the, of the new board. So flip it over. That ensures that you have opened the pores and kind of uh, removed, I almost call it a brazing, uh, that it's kind of a shiny surface to the, to the MGF. And it helps to, to open up the pores on both, both sides. We often get a question that's asked, do I have to seal the, the edges of the spoil board? Simple answer is no, right? But if you are willing to do that, you may find three or four or 5% greater efficiency within the operation of the machine. And I say it is recommended that you should. Few, few ways that people do that, um, they may hit it with like a kills type primer. Others will spray it with a, with a shellac and yet others will, will put it through an edge bander, right? What's the typical depth of a fly cut? Uh, we typically say uh, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 millimeters is all that you have to take off your spoil board to ensure that it's flat. How thin should you let the board get before you start looking to change it over? Um, industry standards is about 10 millimeters before the board gets too thin and isn't restricting vacuum flow enough and or it's too thin and it starts to really curl up on your edges. And if we're taking three tenths of a millimeter off a board uh, once per day, you're gonna replace that spoil board about every six weeks. And if you are, you know, let's say you're a higher volume nester in that 35 to 60 a day sheet range, you may be hitting your spoil board once in the morning and once after lunch. And you can expect about three weeks of spoil board life in that scenario. Okay, moving back into to the next configuration. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna add some automation to the basic nesting machine, which we see here. We're gonna add an outfeed or a discharge table. And we're gonna discuss what we call concept one or push off type nesting. If you see what's happening on your screen here, um, when we move into a concept one solution, the machine receives a gantry mounted push off device on the back side of the gantry. Within its push off responsibilities, it also receives a dust collection connection. So it's pushing the parts off and sucking the dust and debris off the table. During that same cycle, the parts come off the machine, get collected on an outfeed table. And the benefit here, and this is how we should be running the, these machines, when the parts are on the belt, the operator should leave them. He needs to load the next program in the next raw sheet, get the machine back into its operation, drilling and routing, then come and unload, sort, and label the parts from the belt. Meaning the machine is running while it's also being unloaded. And you start to see the limitation of the velocity of the machine start to become lifted. So of the concept one or the push off solution, um, a number of strengths, it's very clean. Um, we start to see much higher volumes of production, meaning with just this simple move from a standard machine to a concept one, we can find as much as 50 to 60% uh, greater throughputs from the machine. This is the point in nesting where the machine starts to take over some of the pacing and the cadence of production in the shop from the operator, meaning the machine can push the operator to move faster. It remains flexible on its loading side, meaning, you know, let's say you're a shop that does 50 sheets a day, but you're not uh, all white melamine, right? You're 10 sheets of white and five sheets of blue and some cherry veneer. And, you know, in this type of scenario, you can have all of those materials, those bunks or those packs staged around the machine and the operator simply gets what he needs when he needs it and loads it to the machine. As we discussed in the previous graphic, you're able to la label, unload and sort in what we say a zero negative cycle time impact, meaning you're unloading and labeling while the machine is in the next cut. 
And I think this is where an ROI becomes easier. So if in your minds you've justified a basic nesting machine as something that you would invest in in your shop, here we say for roughly an increase investment of 20% over a basic nesting machine, we can find you 40 to 60% greater throughput. And in most cases, that's a fairly uh, powerful ROI type statement. Um, there are some weaknesses here as well. Um, it is manually loaded, meaning so we start to pace the operator, but we don't control him. If he doesn't choose to load the machine and then go unload and sort, the machine's throughput will, will suffer. We are dealing with expanded footprints, meaning you know as we start to move through these levels of automation, um, they're linear, so we grow in length. So a let's use a 10 foot router, for example, a five by 10 router basically doubles in size when you install a 10 foot outfeed table as well. So we get longer, we need more, we need more, we need more footprint. Tips for these type of scenarios. Uh, again, nothing new, um, but we're just finding ways to make them a little bit more efficient each year. Uh, loading aids. So we, these are still operator dependent on the loading side. If we can help the operator load them quicker and easier and faster with less fatigue, we're helping our, our shops, we're helping our bottom lines. I say loading aids. These can be um, vacuum loading devices. I kind of talk to them about like motorcycle handle things. You pick up the board and the operator doesn't lift the panel the device does. Um, that ensures that you know, your operator is able to do the same amount of production on Monday as he can do on Friday. Um, in these scenarios, dust collection is vitally important, meaning if we are trying to clean dust and debris off the table with the machine, we cannot cheap the dust collection, meaning read your proposals, understand what the machines require for dust collection, and, and get it there, right? Otherwise, they're not going to operate as, as possible. From our side as a machine manufacturer, if you give us the dust collection we want, most of us now are installing blast gates within the dust collection ports on the machine to ensure that we're making best use of that dust collection that you buy for us, not simply letting it free flow. And then understand the dust specifications that you're getting from your manufacturer. Sometimes we confuse you and we will say cubic meters per hour. Um, that's largely something European based, in my opinion, uh, here in North America. We really want CFM. Um, make sure that you're understanding what you're getting. Um, we typically want on a machine like this about 5,000 CFM of dust collection. That's double, more than double what a basic solution machine needs. And that number is important. If you get over 5,000 CFM, in most cases, that's more than we're allowed to put, I think by national fire code, on a single indoor dust collector, meaning if you want an indoor dust collector, you would need more than one if you're over 5,000 CFM or um, a larger outdoor, outdoor dust collection system, right? So understand what you're getting, cubic meters per hour, uh, cubic feet per minute, CFM cubic feet per minute, and make sure that we're able to, to supply that to the machine so it's able to do what it needs to do. This will be the most powerful slide of all. So now we're saying this is the initial cycle time of the of the basic solution where we had six minutes of waiting time. We're going to hold our processing time consistent at six minutes and 30 seconds. I'm going to say we're going to get a little bit faster loading that raw board with a loading aid. So we're going to load it in 45 seconds. And here's your money maker, right? 15 seconds of cycle time to unload and sort compared to four minutes plus another minute to complete, to clean the table. What happens here is the push off cycle happens, gets all of that stuff off the machine and onto the outfeed belt, and then you start the next program, right? So there's that impact of zero negative cycle time for unloading, sorting, and cleaning. What that does is by that simple investment of a push off device in an outfeed table, we gain five minutes per cycle in available machine time. If you have the volume to utilize that, that means we can achieve upwards of 65 sheets in eight hours. 
at six minutes and 30 seconds nest. Now, I don't say that as a, as a crazy number, right? If you don't need that, it's totally fine. What I would say then is, you know, can we do what you're doing now in four days in a day and a half? That's how I would kind of justify concept one um, in addition to the, just the overall cleanliness and reduction of dust in the air in the workshop. We're gonna take a moment here. We're gonna jump back down to High Point, uh, North Carolina. We're gonna demonstrate a machine operating in the push-off scenario. So there's Greg again. Right here, the manual, manual loading component of the push-off system. When we talk about creativity, right, low cost um, loading aids, that's just a simple aluminum extruded table. We bought the 2020 material and made a table that was set up for one sheet. Um, you could make them a little bit shorter and do four, five, six, or ten sheets on something simple like that. Other customers may have a, a small scissor lift that's available in the shop that's not being utilized and you'll, you'll work that up into the area of the machine. Anything that we can do to make loading, you know, a 65 or an 85 or a 100 pound raw sheet to the machine easier and quicker for the operator, the more he's going to produce for us per week at the machine. So this is the same nest we ran on the basic solution, a little bit different router, which you'll see 50 meters per minute, per minute processing time, and then the automatic push off of the finished parts. Okay, so what this machine is set up, uh, it's actually driving over top the parts with the dust collection hood. So it's sucking the dust up off the parts within this cycle. Then it's gonna drop down to spoil board level and eject the parts from the machine. As that happens, if you can see my cursor here, pay attention to this area on the machine. That's a dust collection grate from below. That will take all of the dust that remains in the cut Right, it'll drop down and get sucked off into your dust collector. So the important thing to look at here is the cleanliness of the parts on the belt compared against the basic solution where Greg was in there, right, with the compressed air kind of blowing that stuff off the backside of the machine. So I don't think Greg's going to run two panels consecutively here. So right now he's labeling. So that's a, this system here is a little touchscreen PC and a zebra printer that gives them some direction as to where the labels go on the parts. And if this were running in a production setting, Greg would have started the next nest before he came over to label and unload and cart parts. And that would be a typical cycle on a concept one or a push off router solution. So as we look to conclude session one or part one of this week's nesting automation presentation, 
We'll do a little bit of recap. Today was basic nesting and material handling concept one. Friday's solution, we will discuss uh, concept two, which is automatic loading from a scissor lift or a roller table on the front end of the machine. Concept three, which brings in integrated pre-labeling of the raw board. We'll touch on storage and retrieval integration of, an, of a nested machine, as well as look into the, uh, the near future with robotics and how uh, industrial robots will integrate with nesting in the years to come. With that, um, Christina will take over the presentation and she is going to coordinate our Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite anybody with questions related to today's presentation to submit them in our question and answer window at the bottom of your screen. There we go. Technical difficulties. Thank you. <laughs> James, we did have a question today uh, earlier in the presentation from Michelle, and he wanted to know, What's the RPM and feed speed of fly cutting with a four inch cutter? So typically in a four inch cutter, we're working in the 10,000 to 12,000 RPM range, right? They're a little bit different per manufacturer. So that maximum RPM is specified by the, by the vendor. And then usually in the 15 to 20 meters per minute processing or feed speed um, for a traditional fly cutter working with 45 pound MDF. Wonderful. Another question, the typical amount of vacuum required for nesting four by eight sheets, how big of pumps do you need with zoning? So typically there's a little bit that comes into that with your elevation, but in most cases, you know, in that 1,000 to 3,000 uh, feet above sea level, around 10 horsepower or 250 to 300 cubic meters per hour on the vacuum pump is, is typical of, of a four by eight machine. Perfect. All right. We're waiting for a few more questions. Feel free, everybody. This is a great opportunity to reach out to James. If you have questions that you just don't feel comfortable or are not ready to bring up right now, you can email him. And again, don't forget to sign up for part two of James' presentation at styles.live. That will be happening this Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. James, based upon today's presentation, is there a common fear that holds shops back from making the jump to CNC? No, that's actually a really good question. Um, there, are, there are two, I would say, from my experience in the market that, that hold shops back from making the initial investment or jump to CNC. First is cost, right? We, we all have to be understanding that, you know, it's an investment. It can be, you know, $100,000 or more in some scenarios to, to get into nesting. And so the cost is, is an area that is of concern, but I would say more often than not, software is probably the biggest fear that we see from the marketplace. Um, I'd say 15 years ago or even 10 years ago that it probably was somewhat founded, meaning it had some merit in that, you know, cabinet manufacturing softwares or alpha cams per se, that type of thing, their post processor or their ability to write code for the nesting machines was a little bit of a work in progress, right? And I say in today's software environment that it's not much of a fear at all, in my opinion, you're gonna see a few things happen there, right? Your cabinet design systems, which I call CAD CAM, right? They draw the cabinets and engineer them, plus write the machine code. 
um, like a wood CAD CAM, a cabinet vision, or a micro vellum. Those type of post processors and their screen to machine capabilities are, are very proven. Some of them, you know, 15 and 20 years of experience. Um, other software categories, right? It, you may not be uh, at that cabinet vision or wood CAD CAM level and you're using Alpha Cam as your interface to the machine. Same type of thing there, that interface is very proven. A third category of software that, that you may see, we call them optimizers. Um, softwares like CutRight or RouterSim, again, also, you know, 12, 15, 18 years of experience posting to not only home egg CNC, but the other ones out there as well. And if you have a fear of software, and it could be a cost or it could be operation of software, look to um, some things that are becoming really, really important in today's market. We call them subscription-based softwares. You don't own them. You don't have to pay for upgrades. You just basically pay your subscription fee each month and you have access to the program. There's a small cabinet design, I don't even know small is the right word, but there's a, there's a cabinet design system called Mosaic, which is subscription-based design and screen to machine. And there's another program out called Enroute, where maybe you're not only cabinets, um, you're something else. You do cabinets, plus you wanna do carvings and signage and that type of thing. Enroute is another small subscription-based fee that brings a lot of power to the machines um, if you guys know HomeAg, right, we've been on the WoodWatt platform for many, many years. HomeAg is starting to do some cloud-based, subscription-based services. And then again, lastly, don't forget about the software that's delivered with the machine, the WoodWatt or, you know, whatever you may get with a competitor. Uh, it's basic, but it does allow you to run your machine right off the truck. So I would hope that software is a fear, but I think with the collective industry, you know, kind of making strides and proving it out over the last 15 years that it's less of a fear today than it was then. Thanks, James. A few more questions to get to. What types of tools can be used with the tornado type HSK holders? Ah, good question. So the, the tornado type stuff, um, if we're doing the HSK nut, it's really no different than putting a, a tool in a normal a normal nut and collet. So um, eighth inch, quarter inch, three eighths, five eighths, half inch, three quarters. Um, as long as you have a HSK tool holder and the appropriate size uh, spring collet for the tool that you want to, you want to you chuck up and tool up, um, that collet nut type tornado tool will work with any of those. Great. James, do nest parts have a minimum area dimension to avoid them from moving? Oh, so, yeah, so this is likely related to small part processing. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the challenges of nesting, right? When you're pulling vacuum through a spoil board, small parts, is, small part hold down is part of the strategy of employing nesting. I typically say, um, 12 inches by 12 inches is what I'm looking at before I start employing strategies to assist the machine with holding the small parts. And by that, I mean the most common is what we call onion skinning, where instead of cutting all the way through the part in one pass, you'll make a skin cut. Let's say we leave two tenths of a millimeter of thickness in that first pass and then come back through the second pass. And we're when you're cutting, you know, two tenths of a millimeter. The, the torque that we're putting on that part within the second pass is pretty small. And that's a strategy to help with holding small parts. It's important to understand that with a nesting machine, your strategy for creating the nest is also important. So when you're dealing with small parts and let's use uh, cabinet vision, for example, you'll set up your nesting strategy when you integrate the software to the machine. You will designate how small of a, of a square inches of part you want before the program automatically applies a skin cut. You'll also have the ability to tell the program, hey, when I get parts that are small or small and narrow, let's say like a stretcher, uh, let's place those within the middle of the nest where vacuum is a little bit stronger 
than on the edges of the nest where vacuum is slightly weaker. And within those strategies of how do I nest, where do I put small parts, do I skin cut, and also you can do some stuff with tooling geometries to help with small part hold down. It's important when considering nesting to understand that small part hold down is not only a product of vacuum, right? It's a product of tooling, nesting strategy, and the condition of your spoil board at the time you're running that, that smaller part nest. Super. We've got questions coming in. We're running close on time here. Uh, James, I'm going to bring up one from Mateus and let me know if that's something you'd like to answer directly. But Mateus uses a B point for line boring panels instead of a brad point to get a cleaner hole from both sides of a melamine board. But that requires uh, him to go deeper into the spoil board than further further than he'd like to. Do you have suggestions to combat this? Uh, yeah, there are some suggestions. So the, in, in, in general terms, a V-point bit is required to drill through the backside of an unsupported panel and prevent blowout, right? When you're dealing with the nested machine and those parts are, for the most part, fully supported beneath them, right, because you have the spoil board beneath the parts. In many, many cases, people operating nesting will do through holes with a brad point bit, right, tenth of a millimeter through or two tenths of a millimeter through. And given that part is largely supported, there often isn't much blowout, right? And then you don't have those, you know, half millimeter holes in your spoil board peppering that thing up throughout the course of the day and the week and the month. Thanks, James. Final, final question, and we'll share some of these with James later, uh, and he can continue to answer questions. I'll share his email in just a second here. But James, what kind of construction methods can you utilize or cut for on a nested base CNC? Uh, largely, any of them, right? So I would say most often if you are, let's say you're starting in nesting and let's say you use Mosaic as your, your software type software, they will largely steer you towards a dado construction just because it's, it's simple. Um, it doesn't require a case clamp. It doesn't require a drill and dial machine. Um, but as you grow or as you look to incorporate construction methods that are um, faster in the assembly area, um, the machines can take those as well. Some of those can be uh, conformat screw. You can go fold, fold dowel with the case clamp, um, staple and screw. I mean, that's, that's still out there and, and still very successful. And you're also st starting to see now some different types of, I say, toolless type connections. Um, Lock dowel can the half of a lock doll joint is typically manufactured on a flat table CNC. Um, so, you know, largely any of them. I mean, we even have customers that are dovetailing their drawers on the CNCs. If, if that's what they choose to do, the tooling and the, the capability of the machine is, is there. Super, thanks James. Again, if you have other questions or you want to reach out directly to James, his email is jrswanson at stylesmachinery.com.